Hello. Sorry, everybody. I had kind of a technical difficulty getting started here. Uh, good to see you online. We've got a few people we need to pray for. A uh, Pamela Bulletin will be coming shortly uh, this evening. I had a couple changes we had to make. Um, we want to be praying for Brother Don this evening. He is, um, he's been taken to hospice, although it's kind of a short-term stay there, I think. He's going to go to um, a, another critical care unit where hospice will take care of him. They'll come in every day and take care of him, but it's not the short-term hospice where you, you go there for a couple of days and you're gone. So we need to be praying for him because I think there's a lot of things going on. He has a very serious um, liver condition to where um, the fluids aren't getting down to his liver uh, to be processed. So his blood isn't circulating through his liver. Um, and he's, yeah, he's having a CDs build up, um, which is like five liters every couple of days they're having to take off of him, which is really serious. And that's because of the, the failure of the liver. So we want to be praying for him because, um, it's, it's not a, it's not a good process he's going through right now. And, um, he's very confused and, um, we just pray the Lord has mercy on him. Um, yeah, Ed, they, I'm not sure they'll do that. And these surgeons have talked to him already. And the one thing that they're afraid of is they're afraid he, he won't make it through surgery. So, and, and he quite honestly doesn't want to go through the surgery. He'd have to go through because they, they have to split him open pretty far to get into his liver and stuff. So we want to be praying for him and uh, that the Lord just touch him and, and help him out. Um, yeah, he is very alert. That's what I heard. Well, let's pray and um, let's continue to pray for our country. Uh, we need we need a lot of things to happen and bring the people together. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, you know, Father, we ask you to touch the people of Messiah Community Church, Father God. Let them be lights on a hill. Father, lights that shine your love and your glory to to the earth and Father, into the hearts of men. Father, we pray for Brother Don tonight. We pray, Father God, that you would have mercy upon him, Lord, that you'd, Father, either heal him completely, supernaturally. He'd be a magnificent testimony of your handiwork, Lord God. Father, or let him go quickly into the heavens. Father, we just ask you, Father, to pour your mercy out upon him. And Father, we just pray mostly your will be done. We know that he's run the race. And he, he's run it hard, Lord God. And we know, Lord God, that he, he believes he's finished with what he's got left to do. But, Lord God, we just want him to be sure. And that your mercy and your grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ would reign over his life. And, Father, we pray for our country. We pray, Father God, that your glory and your mercy would fall on America. Father, we ask you, Lord God, move your people Move the hearts of the people here. Move the hearts of the believers, Lord God, to a place of just radical faith, radical grace, Lord God, and belief in you. And, Father, we pray for your people that are attending church. Father, we pray that they would rise up and grab hold of the presence of the Lord. And, Lord God, we pray for the president, for all those that are uh, under him, Father, for the Supreme Court and all those that sit on the bench and all those that help them. Father, we pray for the Congress and the Senate and for all those that help them. Father, let your spirit rise up in the hearts of each and every one of those people that are representing us in, in Washington, D.C. Father, we want this nation to recognize you, to lift you up, to honor you, to give you glory. And Father, that our, our lives and our lifestyles would, would be glorious to you. And we just thank you and praise you for it, Father. We thank you for your church reviving. We thank you for your church rising up, O oh Lord God. And we just praise you, Father God, for the lesson tonight. We're going to have a good lesson. We're going to have our minds open and our hearts open. We're going to receive the glory from you. And Father, we pray for Dixie's family. Father, this cousin that just lost her husband, Father, and that she's she's not come to you. Father, we, we pray, Lord God, send people to her to soften her heart. Holy Spirit, go before the, the witnesses that go to her. 
and soften her heart, Lord God, that she would receive the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified. We thank you for it and praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Dixie had called, and she asked us to pray for her cousin a couple weeks ago. He had um, pancreatic cancer, and he was doing really, really bad. Um, and he did pass away. I think it was Monday night he passed away. And But his wife doesn't know Jesus, and she, her heart's really kind of hardened over this whole situation. So be praying for her. Her name is Dana. And uh, we just believe that the Lord's going to witness and testify to her. So let's get into our lesson. We've been studying and looking at Jesus here in all different ways. Um, all day, we want to let you know uh, Don Andriaco is, um, he is in the hospital. And he's, um, he is uh, not doing very well. His, his, the port to his liver is clogged up, and so he's not getting blood into his liver to be purified, which means all that poison is going back into his system. So be praying for them. Yeah, and for Sue's sister, um, I'd forgotten about Sally. Pray for her. Sally's going through is going to be going through um, surgery, uh, cancer surgery, breast cancer surgery. So be praying for her. Um, and, and she really... Um, she really needs to have a move of God in her life. So be praying for, for her as well. Um, let's take a look here at Jesus in the Old Testament. And we're going to really take a look. This is where we left off last week. We're really going to take a look at, at Noah tonight. Man, what a fascinating story. The, the more I get into checking out some of these people in the Old Testament, the more fascinating it becomes. Uh, what an, an incredible knowledge and, and wisdom that they had and and just insight into things. Uh, in Genesis 4, 25 and 26, it says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore him a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also was born, a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call in the name of the Lord. Well, Enosh is actually the Hebrew name, which is or Hebrew uh, word, which just means men. If we're talking about men, we're talking about Enosh. Um, so um, Seth is in the righteous line from which Messiah shall come. And it's obvious that he is here because she says that God's given her uh, in the place of Abel, he's given this son, this new son, um, Seth, um, and she said, well, she implies that Abel knew exactly what was required. Yeah, another seed, exactly. Um, Abel knew exactly what it would take to come before God. That's the reason why his, his sacrifice was accepted and, and his brother Cain's wasn't. Abel knew. Well, then Cain rises up and kills Abel. And then another son is given, another seed is given. Um, and he knows as well, Seth is the godly line that comes forward. So let's take a look from here because this leads us up to Noah. Seth has a son named Enos, which simply means man. The scripture tells us that after Enos was born, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Is what, the, is what the translation says. King James and New King James, both of them say that, and I think NIV as well, say, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Well, properly, it says this, at that time, profanity began to be called out regarding the name, the conspicuous position, that, that word name means conspicuous position of the Lord. This is thought by many Old Testament scholars and ancient teachers that this is when idol worship began. There's, there's a lot of rabbis um, who, in their commentary, going way back, before the time of David even, that tell the story of how idol worship actually begins. And it begins uh, right here at the time of Enosh, when... The, 
they were given, and, and you remember uh, Abel, Abel goes out and he starts having sons, right? And, and they're kind of proud. Um, yeah, they were. They were taught by the fallen angels. That's exactly right, Ed. And but what they began to do is they began to worship the stars and the moon and the sun. And they said, well, if God put them over us to rule over us, which is, you know, which is what Genesis says. That's, that's exactly what the story was. That God gave, his, you know, the stars to rule over the night and the, the sun to rule over the day. And uh, he, they, they say all that. And then what they do is they say, well, geez, if they're going to rule over us, it would only be right for us to worship them. And as well as the angels. Uh, they began to, so they began to worship all these things. And many of them, many of the scholars, many of the old time commentators, I mean, going all the way back to uh, before Jesus, in the, the references of the rabbis, in the, the uh, midrashes that are written, midrashes are kind of like his sermons, if you will, they're, they're commentary on different pieces of scripture by different rabbis. And, and what they would do is they would sit around with a midrash, something that rabbi had written out, and, and they would debate it, basically. They, they would tear through it and they would um, talk about it and, and they would come up with a, really an exact statement of what they believed that piece of scripture was about and, and what the history was and the, the culture was around it and all that kind of thing. That's called a midrash. Well, in many of the Midrashes, they allude to the fact, or allude to, that this is when they believe the myths and the legends were born uh, for Greek mythology. Um, you know, people like, um, um, oh, not, I was going to say Flash. Who, who's the guy that had the, uh, that was supposed to be fast? Uh, Achilles and, and, um, Zeus and and all these ancient gods, they believe that this is when those things actually started being birthed out in, in the in the minds of people. And what they were really worshiping were fall, fallen angels uh, or the children of angels and and, um, and women, earthly women. Um, because the, the angels came down, they cohabited with the women, it says that they left their first estate, and I'll get into this a little bit later on. But, but they believe that that's when this all began to happen. So at the time of Enosh, that's what it's saying. At the time, profanity began to uh, be called out regarding the name. Now, that word name is the conspicuous position, which, by the way, is what... Um, Noah ends up calling one of his sons, this, this same exact word um, means, that means name, we're translating it name, it actually means a conspicuous position. Well, the Lord was in a conspicuous position. He, he was the head. He was, um, he was over them. Well, they began to profane him by calling the stars the Lord, calling the moon the Lord, calling the Son the Lord. And they believe that this is really where idol worship started. Now, by the time we get to Noah, in Genesis 28 through 29, Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. And you see here what they're saying. They're, they're toiling to produce in the earth. They're, they're toiling to, to bring up sacrifices to God. They're toiling to bring up um, things that will that'll enable their lives to be better. They're, they're working hard on this ground, and they're saying it's God's fault. Man, where have we heard that before? Adam and Eve, right? Look at what God did. Oh, God, you gave me this woman. And, and that's the reason why I'm here now naked before you. And I, you know, and I'm embarrassed by it. And I'm, I'm ashamed of my nakedness because you gave me this woman. And the woman says, well, it's your fault, God, because you put the serpent in the, in the garden. If you hadn't put the serp, serpent in the garden, well, I would have never been tempted. 
You see where that goes, right? Now, Lamech has an, a son named Noah. Noah becomes a type of Christ, and then he's going to relieve us from our toil or works. So when Noah is born, it's prophesied over him. In his very name, it's prophesied over him that he's going to be a comforter, which is exactly what Jesus was. Jesus is our comforter, and he's going to uh, relieve us from the work and the toil of our hands because i mean after all god cursed the ground so god's got to give us somebody that's going to relieve us from from going about and doing all this now until this time men were stuck in earning the favor or even the presence of the lord but that's what they felt they had to do they had to earn it and no one was supposed to relieve them of that so there wasn't going to be any heavy-duty sacrifices and heavy-duty uh, toil to try and please God. Now, God, at no time here do we find God saying that, hey, you got to do this or that to please me. In fact, what did he tell Adam and Eve? Tend to keep the garden. I mean, that was real hard. The angels were there to help them. And, and the garden grew on its own. It was it was perfect. There was, I mean, everything that was good. God called it all good. He tells them, tend and keep it. Watch over it. That's all. Just watch over it. And of course they fail. Now, until this time, the the people of the earth are they're uh, they're not looking for comfort. They're not they're not finding comfort. It is the same thing that was in place when Jesus comes along. Between Malachi and the book of uh, Matthew, between that time period, you know, when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are about, and Jesus comes, there's 400 years of darkness that God isn't speaking to them. There's no prophet in the land. Uh, the people are falling further and further into the, the worship of the law and the bondage of the law. And, and they're not... They're not coming into a relationship with, with God. They're, they're going into bondage further and further. The Romans move in. The Romans take them over. And, and now they're in bondage both physically here on the earth. They, they're in bondage spiritually to the law. And now they're in bondage physically. And then Jesus comes along, the comforter. The one who's going to relieve them from their stress, relieve them from the toil. You can see when Noah then becomes a type of Christ. He, he's going to deliver these people at this time now what's he going to deliver them from take a look at here this is a great picture of how men have tried to earn their works in favor of the lord galatians 2 15 through 16. we who are jews by nature not sinners of the gentiles knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law but by faith in jesus christ even we have believed in christ jesus that we might be justified by faith in christ and not by the works of the law for by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Well, the works of the law started a long time before the law. Because basically the works of the law are a way, just another way, that man is trying to work toward the favor of God. And as we know from, we know from Genesis all the way back to when Jesus comes, you cannot work and gain God's favor because we're flawed. We can never do everything that's, that is necessary for the Lord to be pleased with us. That's the reason why our, our salvation has to be by grace. If it's not by grace, then it means we can work for it, which means Jesus didn't have to come. Because if we could work for it, it wouldn't be by grace. Well, and, and I know what people say, well, yeah, but you have to keep yeah, Ed, you're right. We, we are justified by John 3, 16. And, and that's how we became just. We were, not, we were never justified. We were never sanctified. We were never going to be glorified without Jesus. It just is impossible because man inherently is flawed. At the core of his being, he's flawed. And we're all that way. And that's the reason why we, we study these Old Testament scriptures and man we start finding out. I mean, the New Testament says all these were given, book of Hebrew, all these were given as examples for us. 
but we might know how this thing works, right? But we might know how faith works, we might know how grace works, and we might know how the law worked. So here we find in, in Galatians 2, 15 and 16, we see exactly, I mean, Paul lays it out. And he says, hey, we who are Jews by nature, not, we're not sinners like Gentiles, we're Jews by nature, Cho the chosen people by nature is what he's saying, the ones that God spoke to, the ones that God sent his prophet to. We're those, we're not, the, we're not like the sinner Gentiles. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus. So even, even we Jews who know the law have been justified by faith in Christ Jesus and not by the works of the law. Because he says, nobody can work and be justified before God. So what were the people back in the Old Testament before the law even came along? What were they trying to do? They were trying to work. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 22. Take a look here because this leads us up to the days of Noah. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. Now, here Noah is directly linking the works of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. Here, here Noah is directly linked. Paul's directly linking Noah and the works of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection. And he, he puts this together beautifully. Um, or not Paul, Peter, I mean. Uh, because he says, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. What did Noah do? Noah suffered. It took Noah a hundred years to build the ark. Think about that. The, the guys, I mean, he's not, everybody around him is living to eight, nine hundred years, but he doesn't know how long he's going to live. And he spends a hundred years of it building the ark. For people who the whole time are ridiculing, they're laughing at him. They're saying all kinds of things about this nutcase out there in this field, building this boat. There's not even any water around. There's never rain. They, 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 don't, they haven't seen an ocean. They don't know what the seas are. I mean, they've never seen anything like what's going to come. And here's no out building in preparation for something that they can't understand they've never seen. And he says here that the divine long-suffering that says, and then he had to start a new life over again. Yeah, after everything, right? Now, it says here the divine long suffering. Well, the divine long suffering is God. It, it's God waiting in the days of Noah while the ark's being prepared. God's being patient. He's being patient with all the sin going on. Now, he says that these. Um, these people that Jesus went and preached to, um, that he, he gave the opportunity to, the spirits in prison, he says that they, they are the ones who were formerly disobedient. Well, who was formerly disobedient? Well, there's two groups that are formerly disobedient. One is the angels that fell from heaven and cohabited with the women. They left their first estate. And we'll get to that verse, I think, next. Um, those were they were disobedient, but then also the people who were worshiping idols, who were worshiping the sun, the moon, the stars, and everything else, and the angels that came down. Those ones were also being disobedient. So they were all disobedient. And in fact, God said that their hearts were always continually evil. Imagine that if every single person on the earth, except for you and your family, were always continually evil. The, the thoughts and intents of their heart, every thought and intent of their heart was always continually evil. And it says that he, Jesus went and preached to them who were in prison. 
but only eight people made it out. Then he says, there is also an antitype, which now saves us, baptism. We just baptized uh, three souls on Sunday. This is an antitype, which now saves us. Now, the baptism itself doesn't save us, but the baptism that Noah underwent, think about that. Noah was baptized with water because the whole, uh, all the waters of the heavens fell on the earth. They, that great uh, expanse that separated the waters above and the waters beneath. You know, the, the waters beneath broke open, flooded the earth. It, it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Um, the, the seas rose. Water fell from the sky like nobody's business over the whole planet. And even the mountaintops were covered so that there was no escape for anything or anybody except for Noah and those who were in the ark. So this baptism does save us in, in, in a way. It's not the removal of the filth of flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. So our baptism, our water baptism, is an answer of a good conscience that we already received through faith in Jesus Christ, through faith in his resurrected uh, being, through faith in that, this baptism does save us because it's the answer. It's our answer from a, a conscience that's already been cleaned, a, a filth of the flesh that's already been removed. And it says, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Now, the waters flooding the earth is also a type and shadow of our baptism in water. Notice also, man, I found this really, really interesting. It says, the angels and powers having been made subject to him. Been made subject to him. You notice that? They, they weren't made subject to him before. But they were made subject to him. So, when Jesus entered into the heavens, as a, as a human being, a resurrected human being. He, he was crowned and glorified by his father. Seated on the throne of his glory. And all of the angels and all of the powers. Now, many of the rabbis and, and commentators back in the day considered that demonic forces, the devil himself, the, the wicked one, as he's referred to in the scriptures, um, Lucifer, uh, the one that Job talked about, visiting uh, the throne room of God and, and challenging God on the people of the earth. That one, they were considered to be the powers, the spiritual wickedness in high places, the, 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 the anti-God, uh, if you would. And this says that when Jesus got there, to the right hand of his father, he was placed in authority. He was placed in power. He was placed in dominion over all the authorities and powers, which were made subject to him. Yet they had the flooding dig it rid of the bad guys. Um, and, and Ed, you're exactly right. When, when Jesus was here on the earth, I mean, what did the people say? Who is this that speaks with such authority? And we, we see just as everything that was alive on the earth at the time of Noah was put under, uh, really under the authority of Noah, because they couldn't get in the ark without him. They didn't want to come in the ark. When Noah got in the ark and the door was shut behind him, it says that God closed the door for him. Now, who do you think it was that closed that door? It was Jesus. And he closed the door. And nobody was allowed in. And when the rains began to fall, guess what? They wanted in. Now, in um, according to the book of Enoch, interesting, interesting read. If you've never read the book of Enoch, I would encourage you to, to find a copy of it somewhere. And, and sit down and read it. Now, the, the first book of Enoch, 
uh, they believe was really written by Enoch. The, the second book of Enoch and the subsequent chapters that followed the, the first book um, were, were written by other people, certainly way back in ancient times. So a lot closer to the incidences that were talked about. And they believe that the, when Enoch wrote what he wrote in first Enoch, uh, that he gave it and passed it on to Noah, and Noah took it in the ark with him and, and kept that. Uh, and then it, it became well known. But the, um, because of some of the things that it, um, that it says, the rabbis would not embrace it into the canon of Scripture. For one thing, because it was written before Moses. Primary thing, it was written before Moses. That knocked it out of contention to be included in anything else. Um, but the Book of Enoch is an interesting read. And there are also other extra biblical ancient writings. Um, and according to them, the angels that rebelled and cohabited with the daughters of men are the ones in prison after the flood to be held for judgment. So when Peter talks about th that the there are uh, angels who left their first estate and were cast into like a fire and bound up. It, it was kind of a halfway house, yeah. Um, how many had 200? Yeah, it may, may certainly have been that. Um, that they were they were bound up waiting for the judgment. They're, they're not loosed. They're, they're bound up. Those who died in the flood were also in prison in Gehenna, waiting for the time when Jesus would go and preach to them his righteousness by faith. Now think about that. They died without faith. They died without faith. They died without a relationship with God. They died without uh, worshiping God. And, and yet God is merciful to them, sends Jesus down to them to preach to them in the midst of, of prison. It's the first prison ministry. Uh, now, we don't have any idea what the results of this message to those lost souls in the underworld. We don't have any idea what the result of that was. What we do know, um, yeah, Azazelo, isn't it, was the, the leader who held most accountable, yeah, who was held most accountable. Yeah, that's the one that um, Enoch points out, I believe. Um, many believe this is where the idea of purgatory comes from, where you go down and, and yeah, he led captivity captive. Exactly, Richard. And, and that's, that was a prophetic word in the Old Testament and, and repeated in the New Testament, by the way, that Jesus went and led captivity captive. They knew there, there were souls who were captive in the underworld. They, they were not allowed entrance into heaven. So when people died, they went to uh, Gehenna. And um, while they were in this underworld, they were, um, it was kind of, it was considered a dry place. And then comes Jesus. Now, there's a side, the bosom of Abraham, where uh, the righteous souls, those who were trusting, believing forward to Messiah, where they went to. And not to get too deep in the woods here, but they went there, and, and when Jesus went down, he also preached to them that he was the one. Then it says, in the, the New Testament says this, that there were uh, the souls of the prophets. You can imagine that. The prophets of old walking around Jerusalem preaching. Um, and, and they had an opportunity to get out. Now, we don't know what happened to the people who were in the bad side, but the side where the, the rich man went. In the, in the story of the rich man Lazarus that Jesus tells, he says the rich man was in the, the not paradise side, and while Lazarus was in the paradise side, and they couldn't touch each other. There was a great gulf between the two, is what Jesus says. Now, the one that got the rich man, he said he thirsted. And and he said, just listen, just dip your finger in some water and touch my tongue. Touch, touch my lips. Just touch, give me just a drop and I'll be better. That's how bad it was. Well, 
Jesus went down and gave them an opportunity. But Jesus also said that there would be wailing and gnashing of teeth. That there would be wailing and gnashing of teeth. When his message was preached, there would be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, oftentimes I think people think, well, that's, you know, that's people being thrown into hell and, and all that. But that expression is, is only used in, in the writings of the rabbis in that, the gnashing of teeth. For somebody who's angry, the, the vehemently, you know, uh, the vehemently angry, growling, so to speak. And when when they hear the message that Jesus brings to them of God's grace, his love for them, they, they don't repent. Instead, they gnash their teeth. They're angry. They're angry. Who knows what? It, what they believe, that God, it, 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 the devil... That they're angry about something, but but they don't believe. It, and it says that they're cast down into hellfire. Now, in Second Peter, take a look at these verses two, four through five. It says, "For God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment." This is those angels I'm talking about who left their first estate. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So here, Peter um, kind of talks about God not sparing the angels who sinned. No, dead. Nobody survived. Not one, not one single person outside of Noah. There was eight people that survived. Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. That was the only people that survived. And all of the blood, the lineage of all the people other than Noah was polluted by these, these uh, angels that had bred with the, with the women. And it says there was giants in the land at the time. Uh, like Noah, Jesus is a preacher of righteousness. That says, after Jesus went and bought, brought the captives out, do you think the side where Abraham was is taken away then and now? Once you die, you either go to heaven or hell. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Abraham's bosom was shut down. It was, it was out of business. Um, and, and now you either go into into hell or you go to heaven. Um, now, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Jesus came, he was a preacher of righteousness. And Noah's preaching of righteousness was get into the ark. Believe God, get into the ark. I mean, that's, he, he was telling them, there's judgment coming. There's a flood coming. Get into the ark. When Jesus came, Jesus told the Jews at the time, there's a flood coming. Get into the ark. I'm the ark. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. They both had the same message. They were preachers of righteousness. They were preachers who were telling people how to get in right standing with God. Meet that works. Quit trying to please God through your actions. Quit trying to please God through the works of your flesh. Because if you continue to try and please God through the works of your flesh, you will never please him. Because he can't be bought. He can't be, he, he can't be pleased because you do something. That's the reason why it's called grace. All you have to do is believe. That's it. Just believe. And having faith in the grace of God and brought through Jesus, brought, brought through Jesus Christ. So Noah has, he, he has the same MO as Jesus. He's preaching righteousness. Telling them to get in the ark. Now, here's some other interesting facts you'll need to know about this ark. By faith, look at Hebrews 11:7. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Jesus is also the ultimate heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Jesus prepared an ark, made of wood as well. Noah is ridiculed before going into the ark and Jesus before being nailed to the ark. 
Sorry for my typo. Um, so, okay, let me let me try and change that, Richard. Thanks. I'm I'm not sure. I might be too close to the mic. Let me know if that's any better. Um, Is that any better, Richard? And let me also maybe turn that down. Richard was saying that the, the microphone was was bad. Um, and I can I can possibly go to a, a different mic, which I think I might do, and, and see if that works. Let me know if that's any better, Richard. Next time. Okay. Um, okay. There we go. Uh, I think it was probably my mic then. So let me let me just move that one out of the way. Um, yeah, can you imagine work for 120 years? Um, Noah was extremely dedicated. And, and I, I do think that God showed Noah the whole picture. I think that Noah knew some some things nobody um, nobody knew. And and in that he he's a type of Christ as well, because Noah is ridiculed for for that whole time that he's building the ark. He's ridiculed by the people around him who knew the story. Jesus is ridiculed the whole time. He's he's there and he's preaching his message for three and a half years. Jesus is ridiculed by the people that know the story. His busy, his biggest critics were uh, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. That were his biggest critics. They, they, were, they were awful in, in their, um, their beating up on Jesus. Now, Noah's ridiculed before going into the ark, and Jesus is ridiculed before going and being nailed to the cross. Now, take a look at Genesis 9. 6, 9 through 10. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked before walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, I want to talk for just a minute here about Noah's sons, because this is an important thing. Noah's three sons represent all the known world. Noah, no, Noah did not forgive our sins. But what Noah did do is Noah... Noah did, in, in a way, get the sins of his sons forgiven, and anybody who would have gotten into the ark would have been forgiven. But nobody wanted to go into the ark. And, you know, I get this question all the time from people. Well, how come, pe how come so and so doesn't get saved? Mostly people just don't want to. I mean, they hear the message. It, and I think in this day and age, man, we need to preach the message. We need to be telling people about the grace of God. And, and Noah's message was a message of, hey, believe or perish. You know, believe or perish because the flood's coming. Jesus's message wasn't that much different than Noah's. Uh, Jesus's message was believe because you're already perishing. You're, you know, believe because you're already perishing. It's not a matter of you know, believe or get punished or perish, it's you're already perishing. Um, yeah, Mike, things we do are done by personal choice or decision. Exactly right. It's It was that way in Noah's time. It was that way in Jesus's time. They chose to, to say, crucify him, crucify him. Nobody held a gun to their head because besides the fact that guns weren't invented then. Um, and it is the same today, Richard. Um, you know, that's the reason why um, it's so important we, we preach the message of grace. Poking at somebody and telling them that they're going to hell is not going to get them saved. It, it, hasn't, it hasn't gotten anybody saved along the path. I mean, some people have made a commitment because they were scared, but it, those don't last. It's when you find the love of God uh, 
that, that you come along. It's when you find the love of God that you actually make a commitment that lasts forever. Because you, you receive that love. Yeah, God is Father. Um, Ed says we also need to preach about hell. Also, Jesus spoke a lot about hell. He did. Uh, and, and you don't hear too many people talking about hell because it's really tough to preach about because you're, you're really kind of preaching an anti-message. Um, the, the, the anti-message is, you, you know, God tells us to go out and preach the grace message. Tell people about Jesus. Um, Mike says we teach both sides of the coin where you are now and where you will be with the love and grace and mercy. Yeah, we, and we, that's positively what we have to preach. And we also have to tell people just like Noah told people, just like Jesus told people, there's a judgment coming. And we don't want you to be afraid of that. What we want you to do is understand that God came in, uh, in the form of Jesus Christ and he died for your sins so that you would not have to fear a judgment. All you have to do is receive that for yourself. And, and unfortunately, for, for many of us, people just don't want to hear that. Hey, Dad, you got me on private presenter for some reason. So when you sent that over, nobody else could see it. But my dad said, everyone dies. Be prepared. Yeah, everyone does. And... Yeah, Richard, you're exactly right. Fear and intimidation just cause rebellion. And and the same, we ought to tell people the same. We ought to tell them what heaven is. We absolutely should. We should, we should give them a choice. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Now, let's take a look. Yeah, a lot of people do say this is hell. There's a whole religion that says this is hell. And, and it's not. It, it, it's going to be far worse. Let's take a look at Noah's three sons because they represent the entire known world. Um, Shem, meaning an appellation or a title, was a mark or um, memorial of individuality, honor, character, and authority. That That's what the name Shem, the name Shem represent honor, character, and authority. Shem is also that is the name that was used when it says men began to call upon the name of the Lord. That word name is Shem, spelt just slightly, or it, it's the same exact Hebrew letters pronounced just slightly different. It's Shem, Sham, instead of Shem. And other than that, that's the only difference. One little vowel mark. And they are, uh, when it says men began to call upon the name of the Lord, Lord, they begin to curse or they begin to profane honor, character and authority is what it was saying. The honor and character and authority of the name of the Lord. That's why in the in the um, in the uh, Ten Commandments, God says, do not use my name in vain. Why? That's what they did at the very beginning. They began to profane the name of the Lord. His honor, his character and his authority. It's, it's everything contained in that. Now, as it turns out, he's also the father of Abraham and thus Jesus, but also of the Arabs, the Edomites, and the Phoenicians because of Ishmael. Now, this is a prophetic name for his lineage because, you see, Shem, honor, character, and authority, ends up being Isaac, honor, character, and authority. And then moves on up the chain until Jesus. But there's a knockoff of that. Those that profane the name of the Lord. Ishmael. See what I mean? The Arabs, the Edomites, and the Phoenicians. Ham is the eventual father of the Egyptians. Midianites and the Philistines. Ham means hot. His children are often associated with those who have quick tempers, or those who, through history, have caused much of the world's issues. Most of the world's issues. They're, the current um, current group of uh, terrorists um, 
at, at many of them are Philistines. And, and they, they cause a lot of problems down through time. Ham is also the one who, you know, mess around and, and laughed at his father's nakedness. And uh, he remained in the upper regions of North Africa and the Middle East. Um, he He's from that whole region. That whole region, those are Hamites for the most part. Japheth becomes the father eventually of the Asian cultures, Greece, Persia, and yes, Rome. That's Japheth. Um, his name means, get this, now think of, think of what he's, he's the father of the Asian cultures, the Greeks, the Persians, and Rome, the largest empire that's ever existed, Rome. His name means expanse or to expand. Prophetically, he did expand the known world more than either of his brothers. Think about that. All of Asia, all the way down through uh, southern Europe, that's all Japheth. And I guess technically, uh, since the United States was founded by uh, Europeans, we would also be Japheth. Kind of an interesting thing when you start taking a look at it. It makes you want to scratch your head and go, hmm. Now, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh and ha had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them from the earth. The whole earth was filled with violence. The original Hebrew word means all kinds of unjust gain, not violence. Think We think of violence like somebody clubbing somebody, you know, or somebody shooting somebody. That's Well, that's violence. Um, but it's not. It's all kinds of unjust gain. So the whole earth was filled with all kinds of unjust gain. What's unjust gain? Stealing from people, lying, thievery, um, all kinds of adulteries, all kinds of fornications. I mean, you name it, all, all kinds of unjust gain. Look what it says in Genesis 24, 37 through 39. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days of Noah before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the days that Noah entered the ark and did not know until... The flood came and took many and, and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, this is speaking of the second coming of Jesus to the earth. It will be like the days of Noah. Anybody relate to that in today's time? Isn't this pretty much about the same? <laughs> but it was also like that. Through most of the of the earth at the time that Jesus came, there was 400 years of darkness. There hadn't been a prophet in the land. The priests were crooked. The, the high priest was crooked. The Romans had conquered everything. They were crooked. Uh, there was so much of everything that was bad at the time. Uh, and dead, yeah, this is on a much larger scale uh, today, meaning... Now, the ark, it has one door. There's only one door into the grace of God, and Jesus is that door. The ark only had one door. Um, the ark had lower, second, and third decks. The Godhead has Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, yet it's all one boat. I'm telling you, there's all kinds of things here that give us uh, <laughs> the dimensions of the ark consistent with the dimensions of, of the ark are consistent with the dimensions of the, that's supposed to be cross, of the cross. The upright of the cross would have been approximately six times that of its width. If you read the book of Genesis, the ark was 50 cubits wide. It was 300 cubits long. Noah had rooms or nest in the ark, which would be consistent with Jesus making mansions for those who enter in. You know that line where Jesus says, 
hey, if I go, I go to prepare a place for you because in my father's house there are many mansions. Well, there are mansions is resting places. In the ark, good night, Richard. In the ark, Jesus, uh, Noah had resting places for all the animals and for his sons and daughters. Uh, so it was all there. The pitch on the outside sealed the wood together and prevented what was outside from getting in. Our sins stay outside in the ark that Jesus gave us. We're going to end with this verse here. God says, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark. You, your sons, your wife and your sons' wives with you. God established a covenant with Jesus just as he did with Noah to preserve the earth alive. Noah's covenant was available to all who entered the ark. The covenant of Jesus is available to all who trust in him. The ark was the finished work of Noah and the cross, the finished work of Christ. See how Noah, a type of Christ, both of them worked with wood to bring about redemption. And, and it's something I think that um, we start looking through and, and taking a look at things. Man, there, there is so much to understand about Jesus just by looking at, at this Old Testament. I really encourage you to read through the book of Genesis. Uh, I think it'll, it'll be an eye opener to you in, on many levels. Um, one of the comparisons that is that Noah did all that the Lord commanded him to do. Genesis 7, 5. Jesus said he only did what he saw his father do and only said what he said his father heard or what he heard his father say. It, it's interesting that Jesus went in the wilderness for 40 days. Just the flood waters fell for 40 days. He also spent 40 days with the disciples after his resurrection. The rain of the Spirit fell on those disciples for that 40-day period when they learned of him and were able to go afterward and turn the world upside down. That's an amazing thing to think about all those coincidences that are out there. Listen, you all have a great night. Be blessed in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we will see you Sunday. Thanks, guys. Keep praying. Keep looking up. Keep reading. Blessings.